Well, welcome to MIE and to this week's service. As we're recording for this week's service, we're doing so in the aftermath of the death of George Floyd and the, the riots and the protests and the demonstrations that we're seeing spreading across now a number of countries. As we see things like this unfold before us, it raises huge questions for us as Christians. Does our faith have anything to say to this? Does it have an answer to the expressions of sin that divide and that alienate cultures and ethnicities and peoples? Well, the Bible teaches us that we are a fallen humanity. And it's intrinsic to the nature of that fallenness that there is division and hostility and alienation and disunity, uh, both in terms of our relationship with God, but also in terms of our relationships with one another. You know, a sinful humanity will never be anything but divided and estranged and prejudiced and hostile and unjust and violent. Paul tells us that before we become Christians, we, we were living in malice and envy, uh, being hated and hating one another. You, you know, in our fallenness, we've become in many ways the, the exact opposite of everything that God created us to be. And so in our sinfulness, we will always find reasons to, to judge to distance ourselves from one another, to, to, to assert our supremacy and our superiority over each other. That is what sinful humanity does. And we will do it on the grounds of ethnicity or, or economics or education or ethics. Whatever grounds we can find, we will use it to assert our superiority over each other. You see, the gospel doesn't just explain why these things are happening. The gospel is the only thing that offers us a, a meaningful alternative. Uh, in, in, in Ephesians chapter 1, the apostle Paul tells us that God has made known to us the mystery of his will. And it is to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Now, we're only going to see that fully realized in the new creation. When we see those from every nation, every tribe, every people, every language, standing before the throne of God and before the Lamb. But the reality of that new creation hope, it has to bleed back into the experience of the church here and, here and now. You see, if we understand it properly, the grace that we have experienced in Jesus uh, can, does more to unite us than anything else can to divide us. You see, it's, it's only in the church. It is only in this new creation humanity. It is only in this humanity that has already been united under Christ that we have any chance of creating what Archbishop Desmond Tutu famously, prophetically called the rainbow people of God. See, it is only here in the gospel that we will find the capacity to deal with past sin and injustice. And it is only here in the gospel that we will find the transformation that allows us to become people who are able to love across the boundaries that divide so much of the world that we are a part of. See, this, 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 this vision of the rainbow people of God it is one of the reasons why at MIE we focus so relentlessly on the global church. It's why we lift our eyes beyond our own communities, our own peoples, and, and see what God is doing throughout the nations, throughout the peoples of the world. It's why we pray. It's why we give. It's why we visit. It's why we do all we can to support our brothers and sisters in Christ, whatever part of the world they are proclaiming Jesus in, and amongst whichever people they are doing it. You see, in the final analysis, the only hope that we have in the face of evils like prejudice and discrimination and racism, the only hope that we have 
is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the rainbow people of God, the church, that that gospel always gives rise to. You see, Jesus alone has broken down the dividing wall of hostility and has reconciled us to God and to one another through the cross. And that is why there will be people from every nation, every tribe, every people, every language standing united together in their worship of God and of the Lamb. So who are the MIE mission partners? Uh, well, I wonder if you could list them out. I wonder if you pause the service right now, would you be able to name all the people who we are involved with partnering with and supporting uh, and learning from as they work throughout the people of the world? Well, why don't you try it? Why don't you pause the service and see how many of them you can name? Well, how did you do? Uh, do you realize we've got 10 partnerships. Uh, Tim and Maggie David are working with Wycliffe Bible Translators throughout French-speaking Africa. Uh, Maggie's going to be preaching for us later in, in our service. Uh, Steve and Cherie Francis, who've been working in Nepal, have just returned to the UK. We're going to be hearing from them later in our service uh, as well. Uh, Joel and Fiona involved in leading United Missions to Nepal. Uh, they're at the very forefront of responding to the coronavirus crisis as it unfolds in that country. 
Uh, meanwhile, much closer to home, Michael Green working with the Church Missionary Society amongst Arabic speakers and refugees here in Ipswich. Uh, Anna Gavid working with the Birmingham City Mission in some of the most multi-ethnic schools and communities in, that, in the city of Birmingham. Uh, Peter and Cynthia Emson who worship here with us at MIE but seem to be always off traveling somewhere in the world training churches and working with children and helping them to develop children's ministries. And we're also part of the Diocese of St. Edmundsbury and Ipswich. So we enjoy being part of the link that we have with the Kagira Diocese in the north, northwest uh, corner of Tanzania. We also support IM Cares, which is based in India and is on the front line again in dealing with the effects of the coronavirus, particularly in Mumbai. The Leprosy Mission works across South Asia and Africa works with some of the world's uh, poorest and most isolated and rejected uh, peoples. And finally, Open Doors. We're going to be uh, revisiting our partnership with Open Doors in a couple of services time. Um, but just let me say now that they work with uh, supporting the church in countries and regions where Christians are persecuted and marginalized because of their faith in Jesus Christ. Well, Alison's going to be uh, leading us in prayer a little later in our service as we uh, continue to support all of those folk and hold them before the Lord. But right now, let's sing together of our great and glorious King. Men of faith, rise up and sing of the great and glorious King. You are strong when you feel weak, in your brokenness complete. Shout to the north and the south, sing to the east and the west, Jesus is Saviour to all, Lord of heaven and earth. Rise up with all the truth, stand and sing to broken hearts. Who can know the healing power of our glorious King of love? Shout to the north and the south, sing to the east and the west. Jesus is Savior to all, Lord of heaven and earth. We've been through fire, we've been through rain, we've been refined by the power of His name. We've fallen deeper in love with You, You've done the truth on our lips. Shout Sing to the east and the west, Jesus is Saviour to all, Lord of heaven and earth. Rise up, church, with broken wings, fill this place with songs again, of our God who reigns on high, by His grace. today's children's slot. My name's Emma and it's really lovely to be back with you here today. Now as Mark's already said, today is a very special Sunday when we're going to be thinking about our global mission partners. Now I was expecting Ned and Ted but as usual they seem to be running a little late. Do you think you could help me by calling for them after three? Ned, Ted, shall we give us a go? One, two, three, Ned! 
No sign. Shall we try it again? Maybe a bit louder? One, two, three. Ned! Ted! Oh, hello, Ned. Hello, Ted. It's lovely to see you today. I've been waiting for you because I'm ready to talk to the children about our special subject for today. We're so sorry we're late, Emma, but we have a great idea. Oh, yeah, we thought we could introduce today's theme with a song. Everybody loves a song. What a lovely idea. And did you find one we could use? Oh, yes, we just got We've got just the one. Mm -hmm. Do you want to hear it? Oh, I should think so. OK. Okay, okay, guys, 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 guys. Why on earth did you think that one, two, three, four, five, once I caught a fish alive would be a good choice for today's service? Because you said it's Fishing Sunday. <laughs> you said we'd be finding out all about our fishing partners, so we thought we'd prepare a song for them. Oh, goodness. I can't believe this has happened again. I'm so sorry. I'm so embarrassed. Guys, it's not Fission Sunday. It's Mission Sunday. And we'll be finding out about our mission partners. Oh, right. Mission partners. Uh, we knew that. But what exactly are mission partners? Ah, well, I'm glad you asked, Ted. Mission partners are the people who work all around the world serving Jesus in lots of different countries. Here at MIE, we support many mission partners by praying for them, visiting, visiting them and helping them with their everyday needs. That sounds exciting. I'd love to travel around the world. Imagine the sights, the culture, the sunshine, the exotic food. Um, well, yes, Ned, that does sound wonderful. But our mission partners aren't going on holiday. No, they're working really hard. Sometimes they're in areas where people don't have very much at all. They might not even have access to proper food or housing, let alone a Bible or a place to worship in. That's why our mission partners go there, to help. That sounds like it might be a bit scary. I think I would miss my home and my family. Mm, I think I would too, Ted. But I guess if you know that's what Jesus wants you to be doing, then that would help a lot. And actually, not all of our mission partners work in other countries, do they? Mark just told us all about them and there are some here in the UK and there are even some here in Ipswich. The wonderful thing about being, being part of Jesus' church is it doesn't just mean our church here at Mission Ipswich East. Doesn't it? Can we visit some other churches then? Which one should we go to? Shall I pack a bag? We need a picnic? What shall I wear? Okay, calm down, Ned, because actually at the moment we need to stay right where we are, don't we? What I mean is that because we're followers of Jesus, we make up one big global church with all the other people who follow Jesus all over the world. We might not ever get to meet these other Christians, but we know that they're there and we want to help them as much as we can. That's awesome. I wonder how many Christians there are around the world. Well, wow, what a great question, Ted. Now, it's difficult to know for certain, but it's probably somewhere over two billion Christians. Wow! That's a lot of Christians. Mm -hmm. And I guess not all of them are as lucky as us. That's right, Ned. Many don't have a Bible in their own language. Many live in poverty. Many aren't even allowed to go to church or to admit that they believe in Jesus. And that's where all of our wonderful mission partners come in. And we're going to be hearing lots more about them as we go through our service today. I can't wait. And I really hope we find out all about the ways we can help them. I'm sure we will, Ted. And one thing we can definitely do is pray for them. Would you guys like to do that now? Yes, please. Excellent. Okay, so shall we just say a prayer for our mission partners before we go? 
Heavenly Father, thank you for all of our mission partners in all the parts of the world that they serve. We pray you would keep them safe and that you would help us at MIE to know how to support them. Amen. Amen. Fantastic. Well, shall we get on with the service then and learn lots more about our mission partners? Do you want to say goodbye? Goodbye. Bye, everybody. Bye. See you next time. Hi, we're the Havenstein family. Uh, we live and work in Nepal with United Mission to Nepal. Uh, and I'm Joel. I'm Caleb. I'm Isaac. And I'm Fiona. And Caleb and Isaac, how old are you guys? I'm eight. Six. So this is the lane that leads to a little shop at the end and we have a nice field here beside us. There's a little badminton court that the kids play on and women have been playing on increasingly. And people come out and sit at this time of day. And this big building our landlord's family lives in and another family below. And we're on the first floor and our boys are going to take us on a little walk. So it's makai or corn um, growing time and soya beans um, and it's probably the beginning of rice planting time a little bit further on as well. This is one of the two major badminton playing spots ar around in our area made by the same guys who makes a few paths that we will take you on. We are walking in the gully to the place that we call the path. It's a beautiful place with lots of trees. Well, these are the paths. These are like the best places to walk our dogs. And they're also one of the most beautiful. This is one of the bamboo seats down here while I'm sitting on and Shall we take a look at lots of the things that we call the gully? So let me give you an update on how things are for us in Nepal. Um, firstly, COVID in Nepal. Um, Nepal's been in lockdown for nearly three months now. It locked down after just the second confirmed case of COVID. Um, there are currently just over 4,300 confirmed cases and 15 deaths. Now, these numbers are likely to be very um, low, very much lower than the actual numbers because of low testing rates. Um, and we expect that the number of COVID cases will peak over the next three months. Um, and certainly as the numbers in India go up drastically, we expect that Nepal's peak will follow. Um, the COVID outbreak and the lockdown has stopped UMN's development and poverty reduction work over the, the last three months. Um, and the lockdown has had a devastating effect, especially on the poor, the poorest in this country. Um, daily wage earners, for example, have not been able to earn and many of um, many daily wage earners would use that money to buy food for their families. Maternal mortality rates, for another example, have gone up 200% during lockdown because of inability to get to hospitals. Um, suicide rates have gone up in the country, so it's a tremendously challenging time in the country for many. Um, um, UMN runs two hospitals and they largely rely on outpatient income. But again, because of the lockdown and travel restrictions and also people's fear of contracting COVID, the number of outpatients has plummeted and with that, the income for the hospitals. So our hospitals have been facing a shortfall in income of in pounds, um, £236,000 per month, which over the year um, is more than a million pounds. Um, we as an organization are pushing back our annual retreat into 2021 we don't know um, when in 2021 yet because it's just impossible to plan until we know how things are with covid so these are just some of the effects um for nepal schools have been shut and we'll see when they reopen how can you pray for us um we'd love you to pray for our hospitals um, Tan Sen, one of our hospitals, is tr currently treating COVID patients. Pray that the protections that they have in place will work, um, that our doctors and all our nursing staff and cleaning staff, every level of the hospital um, staff there will be protected from infection and other patients. 
Um, our Okaldunga Hospital will probably be treating COVID patients anytime. Pray the same things for them. Please pray that we get our hospital agreement renewed with the government. It runs out next month. And that's the most awful time in the middle of a pandemic for it to run out. Pray that the government speeds up this process. Um, and pr pray for funding for the hospitals. I'll send a link um, to a page that gives more details if any of you are interested in supporting our hospitals through this crunch time. Um, do consider that. For our family, uh, pray for Joel in his leadership. Um, it's a tough and challenging time. Pray for stamina for all of us, for creativity and peace for all of us. And thank you for walking with us. Well, there's a very obvious way in which today's service, Global Church Sunday, connects with our Jesus-centered life term, looking at the life and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It was only a couple of weeks ago that we were spending some time reflecting together on the church's experience in Acts chapter 2, when God pours his spirit into the life of the church for the purpose of empowering them to take the gospel to the ends of the earth and to make disciples of all nations. Right since Genesis chapter 12, we've been told that the gospel would be for the nations of the world. God's vision has always been for a global church. A church that uh, draws people from all over the world into a relationship of interconnectedness and interdependence. And we see that really taking shape as we read through the whole book of Acts. It's not always a straightforward uh, process, but within a few years, the Christian church has exploded across the globe and has become a, a truly international phenomenon, connecting people from different cultures, different nations, different socioeconomic strata within society, uh, connecting them all with one another as they take their place together in the body of Christ. Well, we're going to see that in action now as Judy reads for us from Paul's letter to the church to a church in Greece, uh, a church based in, in the city of Corinth. The reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 16, the collection for God's people. Now, about the collection for God's people. Do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Then, when I arrive, I will give letters of introduction to the men you approve and send them with your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable for me to go also, they will accompany me. After I go through Macedonia, I will come to you, for I will be going through Macedonia. Perhaps I will stay with you a while, or even spend the winter, so that you can help me on my journey wherever I go. I do not want to see you now and only make a passing visit. I hope to spend some more time with you, if the Lord permits. But I will stay on at Ephesus until Pentecost, because a great door for effective work has opened to me, and there are many who oppose me. If Timothy comes, see to it that he has nothing to fear while he is with you, for he is carrying on the work of the Lord, just as I am. No one, then, should refuse to accept him. Send him on his way in peace, so that he may return to me. I am expecting him along with the brothers. Now, about our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to go with the brothers. He was quite unwilling to go now, but he will go when he has the opportunity. Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be men of courage. Be strong. Do everything in love. You know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Achaia, and they have devoted themselves to the service of the saints. I urged you, brothers, to submit to such as these, and to everyone who joins in the work and labours at it. I was glad that Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaeus arrived, 
because they had supplied what was lacking from you. For they refreshed my spirit and yours also. Such men deserve recognition. This is the word of the Lord. The amazing grace of God is available to all nations. And this version of amazing grace is actually in Cherokee Indian. For those of you whose knowledge of Cherokee, like mine, is a bit shady, then the translation is on the screen. David, and along with my husband Tim, I'm a member here at MIE. In 1995, the church sent us, or commissioned us, to work with Wycliffe Bible Translators. We spent 13 years in Senegal, and since 2014 have been based here in Ipswich, where we're both supporting Bible translation in French-speaking Africa in different ways, with Tim mostly working with translation teams in Côte d'Ivoire or Ivory Coast. Our work usually involves us making quite a lot of trips every year, particularly me. Um, But at the moment, of course, we're not able to do those trips. So all our work is by Zoom and email. So today's passage is from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Corinth was the chief city in Greece at this time. 
And Paul had been there a few years before he wrote this letter. And we can read about that in Acts chapter 18. When he was there, he preached first of all in the synagogue and then preached to the Greeks, where we read that many believed and were baptised. And he stayed there for about a year and a half. So presumably he got to know the church and the members quite well. He then left to go to Ephesus. And the reason he wrote this letter was to address various problems in the church, including some factions and moral irregularities. And the church had also written to him to ask for some advice on some matters. Chapter 16 is the last chapter in the, in the letter, and it treats several subjects. First of all, a collection for the church in Jerusalem, Paul's travel plans, as well as encouragement and greetings as he closes the letter. There are many things that I could say, but today I want to concentrate about what, on what we can learn about our role in the global church, including our relationship with our mission partners. And we've already heard earlier in the service about some of those partners, and about what they've been, what they're doing. So the first theme that I want to look at is the solidarity across culture and ethnicity that we see in this letter. If we look at verses one to four, that's where we read about the collection that Paul was making for the church in Jerusalem. And it's probably the case that the, the Christians in Jerusalem were suffering from the results of a famine. And this collection is significant for a couple of reasons. Firstly, because of the deep suspicion there was between Jewish and Gentile or non-Jewish Christians, with most of the members of the church in Corinth not being Jewish. Talking about some of these issues hadn't solved the problems. And perhaps Paul hopes that this expression of generosity and love will help where talking didn't. It's also significant because it's an acknowledgement of their mutual bond in Christ. And this is something that Paul talks a lot about in his letters, including in Galatians, where he talks about how in Christ there is no Jew, no Greek. Something to note here, too, is that Paul involves the church in getting the money to the Christians in Jerusalem. It's not just about sending money, but about going themselves. It's a physical show of solidarity and an opportunity to build relationship. We can have the tendency to think that in order to justify a mission trip, we need to actually accomplish something, go and do something, help at a conference, paint a church, which are not bad things in themselves. But the act of taking the time to go, to spend time with people, to listen to them, to pray with them, these should not be underestimated. I remember hearing a Western missionary talking about how he'd asked a an African pastor friend of his um, in Togo, what he could do to help him in his ministry. And this pastor's response was to ask him just to come, to spend time with him, to see what he did, to listen to him and to pray with him. So meeting physical needs, of course, is important and we want to help our brothers and sisters who are suffering. But it's not just that, it's bigger than that. The message that is sent is that we are one, we are concerned for each other. Now, this wasn't the only church who sent aid to Jerusalem at this time. We read from some of others of Paul's letters that there were churches in Galatia and in Rome who were also sending gifts. If you look at this map, we can see how far apart some of those churches were. Corinth to Jerusalem was over 800 miles as a crow flies which is a similar distance as Ipswich to Zagreb in Croatia. And then Rome to Jerusalem was 1,434 miles as the crow flies, which is a similar distance from Ipswich to Moscow. So these were cultures that were quite different, people who wouldn't really know much about each other, especially in the days without internet. I think it's important too to note here, um, what Paul's attitude is to financial accountability. If we read verses three and four, we see, then when I arrive, I will give letters of introduction to the men you approve and send them with your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable for me to go also, they will accompany me. Paul was concerned to protect himself and others from suspicion. He took a sensible 
view in wanting to, just to make sure that no one could be accused of anything. And I think this shows us there's nothing wrong in requiring accountability. It's good to be transparent. It's good to put things in place so that others can't be, so that people can't be accused of wrongdoing. It's not a sign of mistrust. But of course, we need to be wise in how we express that and how we ask for that accountability. And then the second thing I want to talk about in this idea of solidarity is, come, is the greetings, which comes out in verses 19 and 20. The churches in the province of Asia send you greetings. Aquila and Priscilla greet you warmly in the Lord, and so does the church that meets at their house. All the brothers and sisters here send you greetings. We see from this how the church members in the different places were concerned about each other, how they cared about each other, how they took the time to send greetings to, the, to show that relationship. And this isn't unusual in Paul's letters. We see this at the end of most of them, including in the letter he wrote to the church in Philippi when he was in Rome. The brothers and sisters who are with me send greetings all God's people here send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. Most of those Christians would never have met, but they still considered themselves brothers and sisters and wanted to send greetings. And that's something we experienced in Senegal too, this feeling that all Christians are part of one family. It was very much appreciated when visitors gave greetings from the church that they came from, and they were usually asked to send those greetings back again. And when we came back from the UK and gave greetings from MIE, the pastor always wanted us to make sure we gave greetings back again. It's the sense of being part of one family, of expressing the relationship. So how can we here in Ipswich show this solidarity with our brothers and sisters throughout the world? One thing we can do, of course, is to pray. We can also give. We can be aware of what is happening to our brothers and sisters in different parts of the world. And that's one reason we have these Global Sunday, Global Church Sundays, to help us to be more aware of what is happening throughout the world. We can also send messages of support and encouragement. One way to do that is through organisations like Open Doors. We can get to know a Christian or a church elsewhere whether that's through um, emails or letters or even visits. And one of the goals of our Nepal trip, which we'd hoped to have this um, November, which had to, of course, been postponed, was to meet Nepali Christians so that we could express our relationship as brothers and sisters in Christ, in spite of the difference of culture, so that we could gain a better understanding of their situation and so that we could continue to support them in prayer and ask them to pray for us. So in the next part of this talk, we'll be looking at what we can learn from Paul about our partnership with others and about the balance of local and global needs. But now we're going to hear from Steve and Shuri, who've been working in Nepal. Hi from Eastbourne. We are Steve and Sherry Francis, newly arrived from Nepal. Uh, we were living in Kathmandu, where Steve was the head of finance for a Christian international school called KISC and I was helping coordinate a children's playroom at a local hospital. And we were there for about three years. Despite the national lockdown and airport closure, we were miraculously able to get tickets on a chartered flight out last week. So thank you all for your prayers as we were going through that process. We were happy to be arriving in England during the window of my settlement visa. So now I have my British residence permit without any problems. So that was a real answer to prayer. We'll be discussing hopefully later this week or early next week with SIM, our sending mission agency of what next? Many, many people have asked us that question of what are we doing next? But because of you know worldwide travel restrictions and meeting restrictions, what we would have done for normal home assignment probably won't happen. So we just need wisdom on what to do. Um, normally we would travel around, visit supporters and friends and churches and and report on our last three years, but this is very unlikely to happen this summer because of the restrictions. We usually would also go to the States um, because half of our supporters are there, but 
That is also uncertain at this point. Our plans are to settle long-term in Eastbourne to be nearer Steve's uh, parents and family. And I will pursue re-entering nursing um, as a career. We'll be discussing with SIM options for Steve. There may be an opportunity for him to remain with SIM and do a finance re role remotely. Um, or we may just look at something completely different outside of SIM. So we'll be in discussions with them um, about what next. But we would really ask for prayer because we have been with SIM overseas for about 25 years. So for us moving back here to England, we're starting from scratch. We'd also just ask for prayer on how to do home assignment, how to connect with people in these very uncertain times with all the restrictions in place. And just pray for us as we plan how to set up home and find jobs and to get established in our local church and just build friendships to build a home here in England. We just ask for prayer. And please pray for Nepal as well. Um, obviously, we'd like you to keep praying for Nepal, even though we're not there. Um, Nepal has been in lockdown since March and continues to be in lockdown. Uh, there's been actually very few cases of the virus um, re officially reported, although there's not a lot of testing going on, so real numbers may be a lot higher. One of the biggest problems Nepal has is that about 10% of its population is working overseas in Malaysia, the Middle East and India. That's almost up to 3 million people and a lot of them have lost their jobs and are wanting to come back to Nepal, mm -hmm. but the government is reluctant to let them all in because they might bring more virus cases. So pray for wisdom for the government as they try to repatriate people. We've already heard reports of thousands of Nepalis coming across the border from India, going into some sort of basic quarantine and then being taken in busloads back to their villages. So there's a real fear in the country that more cases will come in as these Nepalis return to their country. Recent cases, official numbers have gone up from about 10 to over 2000 just in the last few days. So numbers really are starting to go high now. Um, so just pray for the, the health system to be able to cope and for the government to implement wise policies. A lot of their policies up to now have been quite reactionary. And pray for the Nepali church. The, the church is strong across the country, um, but pray for them to be salt and light to their neighbours and friends um, in a very negative environment towards the church. It's difficult for Christians. Um, and then please also pray for KISS, where I've been working. Pray for new teachers for the upcoming academic year. Pray for wisdom for the school leadership to decide when to switch from online learning back to teaching on site. Um, although a lot of the children are from mission families, about 25% of the children are actually from non-Christian families. So the, the school has a, a tremendous outreach opportunity. Um, so pray for that to continue. And obviously with a lot of missionaries um, potentially leaving due to the restrictions and the change in situations, that could affect the viability of the school if the numbers go down a lot. So just pray for wisdom for the leadership as they plan. There's a new director supposedly coming later this year, if he can. Um, pray for that and pray for my friend Amit, a Nepali guy who's taken over from me as head of finance. Some of you may not know, Sherry and I got married in 2003 and moved to Ipswich and started attending St John's for a year before we went to Thailand in 2005. And so St John's has been supporting us since 2005, so 15 years mm -hmm. while we've been in Thailand 11 years and now Nepal for three years. And we want to thank you as a church and as individuals for your, all your support and your prayers. And we look forward to continuing to partner with you over the next few months as we finish our home assignment and transition mm. into our new life. Mm. So yeah, thank you for your support you. and your prayers. Yeah.
hands that Jesus is alive. From the cradle to the grave, from the stable to the cross, His life was offered up in sacrifice for us. He came from heaven's throne to seek and save the lost, to reconcile us back to Continue to see now what we can learn from our passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 16. In the first part, we were looking at the solidarity across culture and ethnicity that we saw in Paul's letter. We're now going to turn to looking at partnership in mission, partnership between churches and their mission partners. If we look at verses 5 to 6, after I go through Macedonia, I will come to you or I'll be going through Macedonia. Perhaps I will stay with you for a while, or even spend the winter, so that you can help me on my journey wherever I go. Now this expression, so that you can help me on my journey, or in the NIV, it's you can send me on my way, was a technical term that was used to imply supplying insistence or physical support for someone who was traveling. So it probably included supplying equipment and finance, as well as encouragement and prayer in the case of Christians. So we can see from here that Paul takes it as a given that church will partner with him in his mission. We see that too in his letter to the church at Philippians, where he says, You have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. And we read too in Philippians about how they supported him financially. So this seems to have been quite a normal thing for Paul, that the churches that he has planted then go on to support him financially and be part of his mission to other places. It's important though to note that earlier in this letter, in chapter 9, verses 6 to 14, as well as in his letter to the Philippians, Paul is at pains to make clear he is not trying to take advantage of the people, of the church members. His goal is not to get rich from them. And that, of course, is sometimes has been the case. Uh, we've seen in our country with, or in, in the West in general with some TV evangelists where their goal seems to be just to get rich on other people. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, If we have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? If others have this right of support from you, shouldn't we have it all the more? But we did not use this right. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. Paul doesn't want this to get in the way of the gospel of Christ. And there are times we read about how he works as a tent maker rather than relying on others to support him financially. 
Paul's concern is that the church members don't think he's trying to take advantage of them financially. And that reminded me of a Russian colleague that we had in Senegal who'd been sent there by her church to work in Bible translation. She was very aware of what her church had sacrificed for her to be there. And she was concerned that they wouldn't think she had a higher standard of living than they had. And one of the decisions that that um, led her to make was not to do French study in France, as we had, but to do it in Senegal. It's important, though, too, to note that Paul does go on to say, um, still in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Don't you know that those who serve in the temple get their food from the temple, and that those who serve at the altar share in what is offered in the altar? In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. So I think this letter is a challenge to mission partners and churches alike to remember what our ultimate goal is. We share the goal of serving God. And then having that goal in mind, goal in mind, we do what's necessary to achieve that. For some of us, it's to be full time missionaries or church leaders and to be financially supported by Christians. For others, it's to give financially so that others can do that. But for all of us, our goal is not our material wealth, but it's the gospel. Another thing that we can learn from Paul's letter here uh, to the Corinthians is about mutual visits. In verse 7, he writes, This time I don't want to make just a short visit and then go right on. I want to come and stay a while if the Lord will let me. Paul wants to visit the Corinthians. He wants to spend time with them. He wants to have a relationship with them. And it's important for mission partners to have the opportunity to not just come and speak at the front of a church, but have time to get to know people. When we were based in Senegal, Senegal and visiting UK in the summer, it was important for us to be able to take time with you here at MIE, visiting home groups, being invited into people's homes, as well as taking time with members of the other churches who support us. But this letter isn't just about Paul visiting the Corinthian church. We also read in verse 17. I am very glad that Stephanus, Fortunatus and Achaius have come here. They have been providing the help you weren't here to give me. They have been a wonderful encouragement to me as they have been to you. We see that Paul really appreciated visits of members of, his, of the church. And that's true for missionaries today. When we were in Sen Senegal, having supporters visit us was so encouraging, including some people here from here at MIE. And that is another goal of the proposed visit to Nepal, to actually visit our mission partners, to spend time with them, to share their lives. So again, as I said in the first talk, we shouldn't underestimate the value of visiting, the value of encouragement, of gaining understanding, of expressing interest in what our partners are doing. We tend to think we need to do something, but that isn't always necessary and can even distract. Just to go and to listen, to share the la their lives and to pray with them and for them at the time and in the future is so encouraging and so important. And then the third Point that I want to bring out of this letter is that global and local concern are both important. It's not either or, it's both and. We can fall into the trap of thinking that we either should be concerned about Christians elsewhere or Christians local, either interested in local evangelism or global evangelism. But as I said, it's both and. And we see here that as well as encouraging the church to send aid to Jerusalem, Paul commends Stephanus and his household for serving the local Christians. Verse 15. You know that Stephanus and his household were the first of the harvest of believers in Greece, and they are spending their lives in service to God's people. I urge you, dear brothers and sisters, to submit to them and others like them who serve with such devotion. And in fact, some commentators think that 
Uh, Paul here was referring to Stephanus helping those who were suffering from a shortage of grain in Corinth. Others, though, believe it was just much more general service, but it was to the local church, the local believers. And the fact that both global and local are important is also true when we share the gospel, when we tell others about Christ. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, just before he went up to heaven, Jesus said to his disciples, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Not either or, but and. Before I finish, I just wanted to mention verses 8 and 9. In the meantime, I will be staying here at Ephesus until the festival of Pentecost. There is a wide open door for a great work here, although many oppose me. We can see here how Paul is open to God's leading. He's flexible. He's looking for the opportunities that the Spirit gives him. And I think that's a reminder to us too, whether here in Ipswich or elsewhere in the world, that we need to be looking for God's opportunities especially in this time of COVID-19 with all the uncertainties that that brings. And in the planning meetings that I've been involved with, with the leadership team in Congo this last week, we've been reflecting on what God is doing there and therefore what they can do to join in with that as they seek to bring God's word to all people in Congo. Now, today's passage didn't particularly mention praying for mission partners. But it's clear from his other letters that Paul writes that prayer is part of our partnership and we're now going to put that into practice as Alison leads us. Let's pray for our mission partners and link organisations. Lord, we pray for Tim and Maggie. We ask that you would help them in building strong communications with their colleagues in Africa in particular for Maggie's work with the partner organisation in the Republic of Congo, that they will understand each other well and have productive Zoom meetings. Please give Maggie both wisdom and stamina as she leads this strategic planning. For Tim, we ask that you would give him wisdom as he finds ways to remotely help the Cote d'Ivoire Bible translators in their work. Lord, we thank you for the miracle of bringing Steve and Cherie back to the UK safely. We ask that you would guide them in their future work, bless them in their time with their families and give them rest. And we ask that you would help them to adjust to being back in the UK and to be at home in their Eastbourne church. We pray for the people that they worked with in Nepal and ask that the projects would continue to be fruitful. We thank you that Joel and Fiona and the boys are well. We ask that you would help Joel as he rethinks the mission's work and we ask that you would provide financially for the UMN work in Nepal. The impact of coronavirus is that many people do not have work and food and the situation in hospitals is very difficult. Lord, we pray that you would give wisdom to the government in their decisions and help the people of Nepal. We pray that the aid provided gets to those that need it most. And we ask that you would make critical finances available for the hospitals and protect all the staff from infection. Lord, we pray for Michael's continued outreach work at Ipswich. We ask that you would keep him in good health as he serves you in this mission. We ask that you would help him to find new ways to reach people with the current restrictions in place. Lord, we thank you for the work that Anna has been doing in the Birmingham schools. We ask that you would keep her well and sustain her during her furlough time. Lord, give her creative ideas to use when the schools return and help to maintain links during this period. Lord, we ask that you would protect Cynthia and Peter as they self-isolate. Help them as they continue their work remotely and inspire them as they develop their training materials 
to reach others with your message. Lord, we pray for the staff and the students at Kagira Training College in Tanzania. Please help them and guide the new principal as they adapt to working in new ways. We ask that you would protect the students that have returned home and pray that all the students would find ways to continue their studies. Lord, we pray for the work of IM Cares, that you'd protect staff and the children from coronavirus. Please provide the finances needed to continue providing those in their care, even under lockdown. And we pray especially for the homeless living in slums in India, that they will be able to receive the medical help that they need and for the medical staff that they will be able to cope with the demands of COVID. We pray that you help the churches as they try to provide support in this difficult situation. Lord, we continue to pray for the work of the Leprosy Mission. Please give them wisdom in their work with people in many different countries suffering and dealing with COVID. Provide for their daily needs and sustain them in their work. Lord, we pray for the work of Open Doors and the persecuted church as they manage the difficulties of lockdown where they are already marginalised. Please give Christians strength and hope to trust in you for all that they need. Pray for church leaders as they pastor their congregations and pray for the Holy Spirit to empower them and give them the resilience that they need. Lord, keep us faithful in our prayers for all our mission partners and link organisations, especially in such challenging times. We ask, Lord, that you will work in each one to share the hope and joy of salvation. And we bring all these needs to you in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> bring our service to a close let me let me lead us in prayer almighty god you've commanded your church to bear witness to christ among the nations 
We pray for those who have gone forth as your ambassadors. Would you give them fresh assurance of your presence with them? Would you give them a renewed passion for Christ and his gospel? Would you anoint them again with your Holy Spirit to equip them for the task to which you have called them? Would you cause their hearts to burn with your love? And would you use them in your service for the furtherance of your gospel and for the honor and the glory of your name?